Hello and welcome to the Zoological Society of London's Wild Science podcast. I'm Moni Böhm, postdoctoral researcher here at the Zoological Society and once again your guide for the duration of this podcast. To make sure that neither of us get lost over the next 20 minutes or so, I have once again enlisted help from people who know what they are talking about. What are they talking about, I hear you ask? Well, today our experts are taking us on a journey to Africa to experience the wonder of the savannah habitat and its charismatic megafauna, by which I mean big furry things, the kind of things you would see in the Lion King. However, we are focusing on a very special part of the African savannah, the West African savannah, which is probably unfamiliar to many of us in the English-speaking, or in my case, also the German-speaking world. This area has seen significant pressures from human population growth, yet holds some of the remaining wild wonders of West Africa. So what are the wonders of the West African savannah? With me now is David Mallon, not specifically a wonder of the West African savannah, but associate lecturer in the Division of Biology and Conservation Ecology at Manchester Metropolitan University. More importantly to our podcast, David is an antelope expert with 25 years field experience of antelopes and the beasts that might eat them. He was also involved in the status assessment of West and Central African fauna in 2014. So David, I assume that at least some of our listeners, like me, are currently frantically searching Google Maps for the West African savannah. Where is it? Which countries are we talking about? Well, the West African savannah is, is, like you say, it's very little known compared to the East African savannas, and I think that's partly due to politics. In French speaking, in the French speaking world, in France and the other countries of Europe that speak French, the West African savannah is very well known indeed. But over here, we think when we hear the word savannah, much more often of the Serengeti and Gorongoro, and in, in southern Africa, which I express, I suppose, reflects colonial history really. So the West African savannah is a band of grassland and wooded grassland running from the Atlantic coast through 12 countries across to Cameroon. So it runs through Senegal, Gambia, Burkina Faso, Niger, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and so on. And it lies between the dense rainforests of the Upper Guinea uh, rainforest belt and the dry Sahelian grasslands and woodlands of the Sahel. Cool. So after this uh, crash course in geography, now that we know where we are, what species are we likely to encounter in the West African savanna? Is it like the East African savanna? Well, it's very like it, in fact. I mean, well, historically, it had virtually all the same animals as the East African savanna. So lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog, elephant, rhino, giraffe, uh, lots and lots of species of antelopes, crocodiles, all the things you'd expect to see in East Africa, except for the zebra, um, and which is, for some reason, never made it into Central or Western Africa. Why, why did the zebra never make? Nobody well, knows, it, it, it? It was obviously something to do with evolutionary processes. Africa was subject to constant pulses of dry and wet climate. So with the dry climate was at its height, the rainforest shrank and the grasslands expanded. And then the opposite, when it was moist, the forest expanded. And this pulsing of two different habitats led to speciation and um, some species taking refuge in small patches of forest or small patches of an arid area, and then expanding later. And it's a very complicated picture, but it looks like the equids, the horse family, were re- relatively late on the scene and just never made it as far as the Central and West African savannas. Nobody can quite work out the evolutionary pathway because there's no evidence to go from. Okay, so in terms of status, how are these species faring in West Africa? In general, terribly. So the the last black rhino, white rhino was never there. The black rhino died out around 2001, 2003 when it was declared extinct when the last animals were killed in Cameroon. Um, The lion is down to about 500 animals out of several thousand, 35,000 across Africa. Um, The cheetah is almost extinct. The wild dog occurs at one site only, uh, which is a site near Kolokoba National Park in Senegal, which covers about 11,000 square kilometres. And that's out of a total area of 1.6 million square kilometres. So it's a tiny, tiny fragment of the former range. And virtually every single large species in the region has an IUCN red list category regionally much higher than its global category. So the, the wildlife across the region has basically been in very severe decline for the last, probably since the early 1980s. Well, historically longer than that, but accelerated since the 1980s. So what are the main challenges these um, species face? Why are they doing so badly? Well, I think there are lots of, there's been a lot of land clearance to convert woodland and forest for agriculture. So either smallholder agriculture, often shifting cultivation, clear a patch, plant it, 
pl stay there for four or so years, leave it fallow, move on to another one. And then commercial plantations for cashew nuts, um, peanuts, cotton, etc. Um, and along with that, of course, there's been a very sharp population growth and a large reliance on bushmeat for survival. So all these pressures have led to the forest clearance, the herbivores go, then the carnivores follow them. And of course, the increasing number of livestock means that there's a very big interface between lions, leopards and cattle and so on, which leads to conflict with, with people and leads to them po killing and po uh, shooting and po or poisoning or spearing the, the lions to protect their livestock. A climate change is another developing factor, of course, but we don't quite know much about that yet, but it doesn't look good. Okay, so not a good picture for the West African savannah. From your experience working in this system in the West African savannah, what's the most fascinating thing about it? One of the most fascinating things is that it, it, it all seems so new. I mean, we just don't expect to see giraffes right over in Western Africa and these things. I mean, there are some species which are unique to the region, such as the, um, the giant eland, or Lord Derby's eland, which is the largest antelope in the world, reaching a, to 1,000 kilos, a very large animal. And it's the fact that these species occur just sort of south of the Sahara, really, in a belt which nobody ever, ever really studied or knows very well, which that means just a, a kind of new little discovery, if you like. Thank you very much, David. So we heard from David what challenges the West African savannah system is facing, so let's talk solutions. Audrey Ipavec is ZSL's coordinator for the range-wide conservation program for cheetah and African wild dogs. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, she's based in Benin and, according to my notes, much of her work is based in the WAP complex. Conservation is full of acronyms, so Audrey, what and where is the WAP complex? So the WAP complex is comprising protected areas, uh, national parks. So there's two, three countries involved? So there in are it? three, sorry, there are three countries involved, so Niger, Burkina Faso and Benin. So that's the a real transboundary complex areas. Okay, so why focus conservation there? What's so special about it apart from obviously the fact that it's transboundary and hence must be a relatively large area, I would assume? Yes, it is. So the whole work complex covers an area of about more than 35,000 square kilometers. Climatic conditions and landscape conditions make this area as a hotspot for biodiversity. So we find a large numbers of wildlife species, uh, large mammal species like elephants, um, lions, buffaloes, cheetah, and also a lot of species of birds and reptiles, for example. So this is one of ZSL's newer conservation projects, as far as I understand. So what specifically is the project focusing on? So there are two stages in this project. The ZSL one is to give support to the wildlife authorities of the WAP complex. The first phase is to work in the Benin side of the WAP complex and to test activities and see what the more accurate and efficient activities are so we can spread them maybe in the two other countries. Main objectives are to help the wildlife authorities for the surveillance by providing some training course, for example, in patrol techniques or intelligence gathering. We are also testing some new technologies, such as the portrait cams. So what are these cameras doing? So they are instant cameras, so they are connected to a GSM network and as soon as they capture human activities within the park, they can take a picture automatically and then send them to people involved in the surveillance and then they can react instantaneously to this threat. So is this a kind of way of picking up on wildlife crime or habitat destruction? Yeah, it's mainly the, the poachers which are very active in the region and it's a tool that is still tested and we try to figure out whether it can be linked to a more efficient patrol team, so more efficient uh, surveillance for the parks. So what have you learned so far from your conservation work in West Africa? What seems to work? What are the challenges? What doesn't work? Yeah, the main challenge is to work with local communities as well as with wildlife authorities, every level of the communities that are living within or without the park. Cool, so a lot of the work is community engagement or government engagement, really. Yeah, the, the, main, the main thing is to have the government uh, engagement. Without that, it's absolutely impossible to do anything in the, on, on, the, on the ground. And that's obviously three governments, right? Yes, yeah. three countries. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's the main issue for this complex. Having a transboundary complex means having three countries involved 
at the same time and uh, working in the same direction. So what are the main challenges when you work with governments? Okay, so the main challenge is to put the conservation and the wildlife as a priority in, in their agenda. And explaining that this uh, conservation needs uh, will serve the people that are working in the park or around the parks as well. Cool, excellent. Thank you very much, Audrey. So the West African savannas are important for cheetah and wild dog conservation, but they are also important for even larger beasts, such as elephants. With me now is Susan Canny, who is the director of the Mali Elephant Project. In fact, it's where we can find Africa's northernmost herd of desert-adapted elephants. So Susan, I only really know about the desert elephants from places like the Kalahari in Namibia. How similar are the Mali desert-adapted elephants to the southern desert elephants in terms of their biology and behaviours? Yes, that's right. There are two populations of desert-adapted elephants in Africa, and they're very similar in their adaptations. I believe. I've never actually seen the ones in Namibia, but certainly the ones in Mali, they're very tall, um, long-legged, they have very broad feet to help with those sand dunes, and they make a very long migration. In fact, it's the longest migration in the world, they're unusual, because they have to find um, the resources they need at different times of year. Cool. So I suppose the other interesting thing about these elephants is that many of the other West and Central African elephant populations have not fared very well in recent years. How are the Mali elephants doing comparatively? Well, there was no poaching until 2012 when there was a jihadist insurgency and a rebellion and a coup. And virtually overnight, the whole elephant range fell under control of armed groups. The government fled to the capital it became completely lawless, so it was full of young men, heavily armed. Then, because the project had been established for about five years, we were able to mobilise the local population to use their cultural systems to control elephant poaching. And they mobilised the young men to act as, to undertake patrols and to detect any poachers and discover their identities. That worked for three years. Uh, we only lost about 20 elephants in that time. And then suddenly, at the beginning of 2015, associated with a sudden decrease in security and a sudden targeting of people in the elephant range by traffickers, asking them to help them find elephants and poachers. And we had a massive escalation. Since then, we've been um, mobilizing a government anti-poaching force, which just became operational in February. And since then, we haven't lost any elephants. But in those last two years, since the beginning of 2015, we've probably lost about 130 elephants. So how many elephants are there overall in that population? Do we know? Mm, we think that before poaching began, before the conflict, there were probably about 500, 550 elephants. And probably now there are probably about 300, 350 so is the, are the local communities involved in the anti-poaching effort? Uh, they are, very much so, um, because they, they understand the link, and, and we include it in our project activities. So before we actually um, decide what to do, we bring the communities together to actually discuss their lives, their problems, what they're facing, and elephants as part of all that. So they understand the link between elephants and healthy ecosystems, and their livelihoods depend on healthy ecosystems. So they will say, if the elephants disappear, it means the environment is no longer good for us. And that actually holds true from a natural environmental point of view, because the elephants are an indicator of a healthy environment. And also from a social point of view, because if you can control poaching, then it's an indication that there's some kind of government presence and enforcement there. Okay, so I suppose overall we could say that we don't just need desert-adapted elephants, but also elephant-adapted deserts. So how do you see the future of Mali's desert elephants? Well, it does depend what happens next. I see a way forward. I can see how continuing our approach could secure a future for them. Basically, we're working with the local people to establish resource management systems, collective resource management systems, that mean that they manage their resources better, so they control degradation, and that means that the environment can support people and elephants together. So if we can secure the whole elephant range so that 
when people get up in the morning and they're making their decisions, and the decisions they make for their own benefit also protect the elephant range. That's our aim. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Susan, and good luck with it all. Last but by no means least, it's Paul De Ornelas. Paul is the program manager for Africa and, according to the notes I was given, the lead on illegal wildlife trade at ZSL. Now, either there is some serious word omission going on or you may have to rethink your job title. To reassure all our listeners, Paul does not engage in illegal wildlife trade but is instead tirelessly working towards finding viable solutions to stop the demand for wildlife. So, Paul, let's go big here. What is ZSL's vision for conservation in West Africa in general and the West African savanna in particular? <laughs> That's not a small question. Um, well, let's see. So, I suppose if we look at the West African savanna, so West African savanna is, is you know, a critically threatened system, um, fragmented, only a few little pockets retain sort of the diversity and the the ecosystem integrity it once had. So ZSL is focused on one of the key remaining sites at which these savannah systems are still intact. So that's the WAP complex. Um, and that's the last place where there are elephants, lions, cheetah in the whole region. So ZSL is looking to support conservation in this landscape, work with the governments there to ensure that the wildlife is protected, the skills and resources and capacity are there to do that. And what are the big challenges that need to be overcome in that system? Well, I suppose the challenges are partly built into sort of my last, last answer in the sense that when you compare the savanna systems of West Africa to East Africa to Southern Africa, they're much more badly hit, shall we say, from a conservation perspective. So they're much more fragmented, populations of wildlife are much more depleted. And that's probably for a few reasons, but probably because they've been, in effect, sort of uh, hit by, for example, trade and, and wildlife and so on for a longer period of time. So the challenges that we're facing, we're coming those, I suppose one is that the capacity and resources isn't there. It's not quite the same as working say in South Africa or Kenya. And the other is that we're going to be facing increasing pressures from expanding human populations, competition for land and so on. So given the expanding human populations and the fact that more and more people will be living side by side with probably diminishing wildlife, how are you hoping to engage communities in your conservation efforts? So that partly depends. Obviously communities are absolutely critical. People are critical for any conservation question. And so if we look, for example, uh, the work we're doing in Benin, so there are communities that come up right to the edge of those parks. There are people who do agriculture, people who might do cattle herding. And th these people might be either impacted by the work you do, or they could be sort of critical actors in terms of what they can do to help support the work you're doing. So looking at ways that we can get them involved, for example, as community scouts and patrols within parks, or helping them provide information on illegal wildlife trade. And as we go into the future, we're looking at ways that we can maybe provide incentives for them from uh, benefits from the sort of conservation that's going on on their doorstep. So do you think there's hope for the West African savannah? Oh, there's definitely hope. Um, and the very fact that you've still got a place like the WAP complex, um, which still has elephants, you can go there and you can see lions, you can see cheetah, that means there's definitely hope and something that we can do to help restore these areas to their former glory. So just to wrap up our podcast, if you had to come up with one fact about the West African savannah to, say, convince funders to hand out some cash, what would you say... One fact, let's see. I'll keep harping on about one place in particular, but if I can do that again, if you look at, compare West Africa with, say, South Africa, uh, or Southern Africa, should I say, in terms of, for example, the savannah elephants. So in the whole of West Africa, which is an area, must be, depending how you define it, must be about a third of the size of Europe. Um, so there's probably less than 15,000 elephants left. And of those, I would say 70 or 80 percent are found within this one place, the WAP complex. If you're talking about lions, there might be about 400 West African lions left in the whole world. And of those, about 350 of them are in the same place. It's the last place where there are cheetahs, so I would say it is truly unique. So if you're going to conserve anywhere, I would conserve them. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for listening.